Thank you very much. It's a, just a joy and pleasure to be here in Calgary. Uh, my wife and I came up last Wednesday. We saw Lake Louise, the brilliant and uh, uh, stunning uh, snow-covered mountains around there and Banff and all. So uh, this has been a breathtaking uh, trip for us. I usually turn down most speaking engagements that uh, come my way, but this one was just too uh, uh, wonderful to, uh, to turn down. And so I thank uh, Friends of Science and uh, also Yvette, uh, wherever she is, for showing us around Calgary uh, yesterday. It's been a wonderful time uh, to be here. Global warming, where's the alarm? I like John Tierney's New York Times comment. He said, you know, I always wanted to be a scientist but went into journalism because the peer review process was a great deal easier to sneak through. <laughs> and nowhere is that more true than in the area of climate science. What you find in the media, in newspapers, magazines, TV, and so on, is just not science. It is generally one-sided, biased type of reporting because reporters really don't have the capability of understanding the intricacies that are involved in such a difficult, complicated issue about which people have a lot of ignorance. The climate gate uh, scandal was referred to earlier. I was mentioned in 51 of those emails, and uh, not very kindly, I might add. Uh, but someone remarked about the fact that many of these established climate scientists were not willing to open up their research and data to others when he says, when we don't know what you're doing, we don't know what you're doing wrong. And that's very important in science that other people reproduce whatever is out there. Michael Crichton, one of my favorite authors, uh, said it very well when he said, consensus is not science. When you are talking about a consensus statement, you are talking about a political statement. Things that happen when certain people in the room can influence others and have control over various documents, you have a political type of enterprise and result coming from that. The IPCC, for example, is a consensus document. But if I'm a climate scientist and I disagree with something in the IPCC, how could it possibly be a consensus? Now, fortunately, about 150 years ago, Lord Kelvin did tell us what science was, and he said, all science is numbers. And so what you're going to see today, it's going to be a few uh, uh, time series and some numbers that I hope will indicate to you that the climate variation we see is really not outside of the natural realm, and that... Uh, uh, Producing these numbers is, is really a job for all of us. Now, the University of Alabama in Huntsville, our climate group is one that builds climate data sets from scratch. And I'm talking about the digital accounts from satellites, from old paper records in a dusty archive somewhere. We build the data sets from scratch to test assertions made about the climate system. So the basics about climate, uh, carbon dioxide, as you know, is a uh, greenhouse gas. It is plant food in its most basic definition. In fact, about 16% of the world's food supply from plants comes simply because of the extra CO2 we put back into the atmosphere. I say back into the atmosphere because it used to be uh, much higher in much higher concentrations. Well, that's a huge benefit. 16% of the world's food supply due to the extra CO2 we put back in the atmosphere. About climate, climate is always changing. Uh, global temperature is rising or falling. Uh, sea level is rising or falling. Glaciers are advancing or retreating. There's never this static picture that you can say, this is what the climate is supposed to be like and it shouldn't change from there. That's just not this system. So, as I said about science, uh, we like to test hypotheses or assertions. When someone makes an assertion about the climate, about global warming, we test those. And so one of the things we've done is we've tested these popular surface temperature data sets. And what we found is that these popular surface temperature data sets show too much warming. Here's an example of one of those. This is from the Hadley Center in the UK that shows a decline in temperature to about 1910, then a rise up to about 1940. That was Mother Nature kind of a leveling off or a decline to about uh, 1975 or so, Mother Nature. That last blip up to about 2000 is our fault. I mean, that's the basic message that you would get from reading someone who uh, thinks they understand the climate system, is that all the variations are Mother Nature until the last variation that was due to humankind. Now, 
CO2 is rising, no question about that, about 0.6% per year. It is a greenhouse gas. You would expect some temperature increase from extra CO2. How much is the big issue? So I want to look at, this is a little bit of a scientific thing, but if you look at the right diagram, when you measure the surface temperature at night, you're really only measuring a very shallow layer of uh, air uh, near the Earth's surface. And so in a pristine environment, you have the warm air above that really doesn't change temperature much from day to night. But down near the surface, it does. Now in the daytime with surface heating, we get lots of mixing. So the temperature measured in the daytime has a bigger characteristic length scale. In other words, it measures the temperature of a big volume of air. Here's the problem with the surface temperature data set. When you start measuring your temperatures in a pristine environment such as you see on my right, uh, you'll have pretty cold temperatures at night. Through time, for many complicated reasons, when you build buildings, when you um, uh, plant crops in uh, places that weren't uh, uh, agricultural before and so on, you actually disturb that delicate cold boundary layer that forms at night. Call it the nocturnal boundary layer. And so that mixes the warm air down so that nighttime temperatures simply are not as cold as they used to be, not because of greenhouse warming, but because of surface development. We tested that in uh, my home state of California. If you look at California carefully here, Central California, I hope you can see the feature I want you to see. The Central Valley is a desert. And here you see a Central Valley that's green. Now, it's green because of irrigated agriculture, but that's a huge change from a desert to green, lush, water-laden vegetation. Does that change the story of the temperature time series? And yes, it does. So I built a data set of uh, surface temperatures in the valley. Is, is there a pointer somewhere, a laser pointer? I forgot to bring mine. If uh, someone hears me and throws one up here, I'll try to catch it. Um, it turns out in the valley where these uh, uh, temperature monitor and where all the surface development has occurred, you see the orange line, rapid rise, highly significant rise in temperature. The adjacent Sierra Nevada foothills right next door show no change in temperature at all. So this is in the nighttime temperatures. And what that says is that that warm air is now mixing down to where that thermometer was and showing you an apparent warming trend over time when all that was happened was a change in the turbulence. Now, to check that uh, with another test, we built a data set of daytime temperatures. And there you see in the valley and the Sierras, no change at all. In other words, that is another prediction that came true for that hypothesis. That assertion we're making that surface development is causing the nighttime temperature to warm, that's important because the nighttime temperature is included in those popular surface data sets. And this has all been published uh, in uh, several places. Now, another problem with that surface temperature data set is it just has pretty bad data. I lived in Africa for a while, uh, in Kenya, and here is one of the popular surface data sets uh, showing what's happened in East Africa for the last 100 years. You see a pretty strong warming there. That's not my data set. This is the uh, UK uh, Met Office's data set. Well, I went and, uh, and I knew about East Africa. I lived there. I knew where the British railway stations were, and those guys were terrific data gatherers back then. And um, uh, tea plantations, all those different places. So I got all the data, dredged it up from paper records, put it in, and created a data set. And this is what the temperature of East Africa has actually done when you do it correctly. Essentially, no warming at all. This is an important place because this is where Mount Kilimanjaro is. And what you see there is no change in temperature in the daytime temperatures, which means the greenhouse effect, which has its biggest effect in the upper atmosphere, is not being felt at the surface. Okay, another thing we test about global warming is climate models. And what we found is that climate models overstate warming. 